The seventh century is pretty poorly recorded, all things considered, but there are two major migration events which would forever change world history. The best known of these is the Arab migration slash invasion slash conquest, and the second of these is the Slavic invasion of Eastern Europe. So today I'd like to look at this invasion or migration and talk about how this event is the key to understanding Eastern Europe and the course of history in the Balkans from that time period to the present. So in previous videos I've talked a lot about the Slavs but I've never really described them as a people or talked about their origins and today I'd like to rectify that so let's go back and talk about um, the Slavs and really go into detail on this. So they first appear in the historical record when the historian Procopius in the mid 6th century wrote about them in one of the various history of the wars. Um, so he describes them as people who live on marginal land near swamps and forest and people who do not inhabit cities. Their settlements are nomadic and scattered. This has been more or less verified by archaeology. Procopius also tells us that they normally fought on foot as infantry and they used pretty standard weapons like spears and bows and shields, but they didn't wear body armor, which is something which made them a lot different than Byzantine infantry who were always armored. He also described their society and system of government as democratic. Now it needs to be said that I put this in quotes because the word democratic during this period was used pretty loosely. This is centuries removed from Athenian democracy, so what an author writing in a non-democratic society with a non-democratic tradition would consider democratic is a somewhat good question that I can't really answer. But what it does mean for certain is that he doesn't think that the Slavs have any great kings or chiefs and that their society doesn't really have a strict hierarchy. He also reports that they have a monotheistic religion around a lightning god named Perun. So they are a non-Christian people and they have a religion somewhat comparable to um, maybe Nordic religion or Greco-Roman religion in the sense of uh, you know worshipping different um, chief deities. If we fast forward a generation to the late 6th and very early 7th century, we have further testimony about the Slavs from the Emperor Maurice who wrote the Strategicon. He also describes their society as democratic, um, and again, the implications are probably the same as the ones that I outlined above. He also is much more interested in strictly military affairs, and he says that there are no real military ranks among Slavs, that they don't have a structured military system, and, or, and they don't have formal ranks, so there is no um, strict hierarchy in the way that we normally think of militaries being organized. He also says that it's not a unified group. So when we talk about the Slavs, we're not talking about a group of people who are unified under a single leader or who all um, are politically aligned with one another, but rather we're talking about a large number of very small tribes. And, you know, these tribes can, uh, you know, sometimes uh, some of them will align with each other for temporary uh, purposes and other times they will go their own way. He also talks about Slavic slavery. Now the Slavs would take captives as slaves just as every other power would. However, they had a tendency to not believe in long-term slavery and after a certain amount of time they would either seek to have someone ransomed or they would simply let that person free and then that person could either stay with them or go home. Um, they don't seem to have been believers in long-term slavery or chattel slavery. He also says that militarily the Slavs specialize in raiding, ambushes, and escaping from danger. He says that some of their characteristics are that they have great endurance and that they are big believers in the value of hospitality. That they um, can endure many hardships, basically, and also that one of the things that matters the most to them is making sure that they care for their guest, and that way they're somewhat comparable to a lot of ancient societies um, which lived on marginal lands and wanted to make sure that any visitor was well provided with food and water and shelter and didn't die due to the elements. 
Maurice also observes that the Slavs are vulnerable in the winter since their tactics rely so heavily on raiding and escape because the snow gives away their position by allowing for um, tracks to be made. So because of that, he often advised attacking the Slavs in the winter when you know their positions would be given up and these small units of raiders could be much more easily cornered and destroyed. One of the difficulties in describing this poorly recorded event is whether to call it an invasion or a migration. And you can make a pretty good case for both terms. So in this case, it is fairly comparable to the barbarian invasions of the 5th century where there is an, an element of invasion but also an element of migration at play. So the Slavs do end up overrunning the majority of the Balkans and eliminating um, Byzantine political authority. So in that sense, it strictly speaking more or less is an invasion. However, the Slavs are so disunited politically that this is not an organized or coordinated process and we can see that evidenced by the fact that so many Slavic tribes followed the leadership of the Avar Kavan, um, who basically just asked for their help and many of them showed up to help him when he besieged Constantinople um, in 626 and earlier when he decided to invade and try to overrun the frontier. We also know that the Slavs settled heavily all over the Balkans and in including mainland Greece, so lots of areas very deep into the Balkans, the Slavs were settling either in or around major centers. However, they didn't really establish any formal states or large political units in that area. So the political impact that they had wasn't that great, and in many ways it looks like they just came into the empire and started farming. They didn't really um, have a political agenda or a um, any kind of real political leadership at work. So usually when you think of an invasion, you think of an organized effort to overtake an area and establish a new form of authority. And um, so this, that's why there's this amount, there's this kind of um, uncertainty on whether to call this an invasion or a migration. I think either term is acceptable because you can make a pretty good case for either one of them though. So let's talk about the reasons why discussing this topic is controversial and difficult. First of all, these invasions take place during what is known as the Byzantine Dark Age, a period from the start of the Arab invasions to about the year 800 where we have very few written sources from the Byzantines, so our knowledge of events is fairly limited. We don't know a lot of details, so it's hard for us to really establish what's going on. In my previous video on the Avars, I pointed out that there was a very influential Kagan of the Avars who directed a siege of Constantinople, and we don't even know the guy's name. Um, so that's you know pretty indicative of the kind of problem that we have. We also have another problem in that the Slavs didn't really have a written tradition for this period, and everything that they might have written about this period is written quite a bit later. Old Church Slavic only develops in the 9th century, and at first it's really only used for church purposes, and only expands outward from there. So, of course, all the sources that we'll have later, you know, they are written much later and they are not really describing what happened so much as what they would have liked to have happened in the 7th century. Now, there's also another problem that's much more modern. There are, the Balkans at this point is still greatly divided by, I guess, what you could call ethnic identity politics. And these disputes over, um, who has the right to what land and who originated in what land, which group is the most pure, which group is the most um, legitimately Greek or Bulgarian or whatever. These are very heated debates and these heavily influence the scholars of these issues who mostly hail from these regions. And many academic conferences actually devolve into shouting matches and death threats and fistfights. And that is not an exaggeration. Um, it's very common in Eastern Europe for people to quickly resort to the insult of go kill yourself or something along those lines over debates over like um, which groups inhabited what region at what time. So this is something that has become very emotionally charged and that level of emotionalism and um, personal investment really does not help us achieve a very solid 
understanding of this period. Um, and if you really want to boil it down, what is the agenda of everyone in these debates? Well, everyone wants the, um, you know, their own people to be pure, unique, and have a really long lineage dating back to um, some group of people who are attested in the most ancient available Greek or Roman sources. And to achieve that, they're often willing to kind of fudge the facts and throw their neighbors under the bus, even when, you know, archaeology and other surviving literary sources kind of uh, make their arguments look a little ridiculous. So let's build on that problem that I mentioned earlier of all this taking place in the Byzantine Dark Ages. This means that we are not even sure of the chronology involved here. So my assumption is that almost all of the settlement of the Slavs in the Balkans took place during the 7th century. However, there are scholars who disagree with that. Um, the city of Sirmium fell in 582 under the watch of Tiberius II, and sometimes uh, scholars have argued that the fall of that major frontier fort is what really opened the floodgates and allowed the Slavs to come in heavy numbers. The problem with that, though, is that within a few years, Maurice had gotten the Byzantine army back into shape, and he was really hammering the Slavs and Avars. So he would have broken up a lot of these settlements, and he was also hammering the homeland of the Avars and Slavs as well. Most likely what happened is that the heavy period of settlement occurred during the 610s and 620s when the Avar Kagan um, organized a mass scale invasion of the Byzantine Balkans, and the Byzantines were too busy struggling to survive on their eastern frontier to do anything about it. But again, we can't confirm any any of these either of these two views because the sources simply are not quite good enough and archaeological dating isn't quite precise enough to make up for um, the difference of only a few decades so it's that's the level of obscurity we're working with right now the seventh century destinies of the Avars and the Slavs are more or less inseparable Without the Slavs providing infantry and manpower, it's unlikely that the Avars could have overrun the Balkans and laid siege to Constantinople. However, without the Avars, it's equally unlikely that the Slavs would have been organized enough or had a paramount leader with the authority to lead a major invasion in the 7th century. So, the two histories cannot really be separated, at least until after the 7th century. Now, um... Later on, after the Siege of Constantinople, when the Avar Kagan will randomly execute some Slavic sailors for their failure against the Byzantine navy, the Slavs will become incensed and rebel against the Avars, and without Slavic support, the Avar Kaganate will begin to decline, and its influence south of the Danube will fade, even without a Byzantine reprisal. Um, and I would say, if anything, that this conflict with the Avars and also the pressure from what Byzantine forces were still present is what did give any degree of unification and statehood to the Slavs. This is what caused them to have at least some minimal level of organization and to um, really start to form a lasting identity which would endure through the centuries. In the absence of complete narrative literary sources to give us a good idea of what's going on in this period, we have to rely very heavily on the archaeological data, and it looks like the 7th and 8th centuries for the Slavs were a time of assimilation, and an assimilation which cuts both ways. In some cases, the Slavs would absorb other people into their community, and there are also cases when they would be absorbed by more dominant groups in certain areas. Now, they settled in large numbers in many areas, so of course their relative fates in each of these areas will be a little different, depending on how many of them there were, how many natives there were, how strong the empire still was in that region. There are lots of factors which go into who became dominant in the long run. Now, in Thrace itself, not far from Constantinople and Thessalonica, Surprisingly, the Slavs are settled in very heavy numbers, and they're settled heavily en enough that they actually absorb the Thracian people, and the Thracian identity will completely disappear as the surviving Thracians will begin to identify themselves over time as Slavs. 
actually after the 7th century there are no more references in the literature to Thracians. The Dacians, who were people who had been um, a Roman province uh, under the High Empire but hadn't been you know, under Roman control for centuries by this point, um, had still maintained an identity to this juncture. However, when the Slavs would settle heavily in their home region north of the Danube, the Dacians actually took refuge in the mountains and would later reemerge as a group called the Vlachs in the 11th century. Um, now, another interesting fact is that unlike most of the invaders of the empire over the last few centuries, the Slavs were not converted to Christianity for a very long time. And in fact, it looks like the areas that they overran either um, did not were not practicing Christianity much to begin with, or they abandoned whatever Christian practices that they had. So either the Slavs ended native Christian practices, or else the natives were not really that committed to Christianity at all um, early on. Now, as I mentioned in an earlier video, Christianity had a lot of trouble getting itself um, to be accepted in rural areas in general because a lot of farmers wanted to keep praying to gods of harvest because that's what they've been doing for centuries and they thought that was necessary to their success and survival. But at any rate, um, Christianity will basically be blotted out in the areas where the Slavs are dominant at least until the 9th century and later when the Byzantines make a concerted effort to convert the Slavs to Christianity. Um, it's also worth noting that the Slavic people are distinct from the Bulgars. We'll talk about the Bulgars at a later date. But um, there are some villages where, um, in Bulgar-dominated um, areas where both groups will live together and sort of form a mixed culture. Um, and there also are some Slavic groups which maintained their identity under Bulgar rule, living in their own villages with their own chiefs. So this process of assimilation is very slow, it's hard to trace, and it also has lots of little complications depending on what specific area you're talking about, since local conditions will affect the way the assimilation works in that area. The process of Slavic invasion, migration, settlement, and assimilation is a complex one, and I feel like it would be more comprehensible if I could come up with a single example of how it worked in a certain place. Well, fortunately we do have just enough information on one area to see this process as a whole. So let's talk about what happens in Greece. Now Greece obviously has had an ancient civilization since about the 12th century BCE, so there was a pretty established identity there. Um, however, that identity was temporarily almost snuffed out because of how many Slavs migrated to Greece. So, large sections of Greece were more or less completely Slavic throughout the 7th century. And even though the Greeks in the area recovered their identity, um, many of the place names today are still Slavic. Um, there are place names that simply could not have stemmed from the age of Pericles whatever modern Greeks might like to think. Now, um, what happens is that the Byzantines make a concerted effort to reconquer Greece in the 8th century. So they subjugate the Slavic people in the interior of Greece. Some coastal cities of Greece never fell, like Athens. So fortified coastal cities tended to hold out. So it's not like all of Greece was overrun, but there were parts. And then in the 8th century, the Byzantines begin the slow and painful process of reconquering the Balkans, and their first target is Greece. Now, in order to make Greece Greek again, if you will, um, they decided that the Greek identity needed to be recovered. After all, Greek identity was central to the Byzantine Empire as a whole. It's an empire which speaks and writes in Greek, after all. So, they took Greek people from Sicily and Anatolia and resettled them in mainland Greece. Um, we didn't cover this because we didn't talk about ancient history in this course. However, um, Greek civilization actually existed in not only mainland Greece, but also in South Italy, Sicily, and in what is now Turkey. So this shouldn't be as surprising as it sounds. Now Greek civilization is limited to Greece, but that has not always been the case. Anyway, moving on.
Um, in the end, with all this resettlement of people, Greek culture won out, and the Slavs, who were conquered by the Byzantines, basically just became Greek. Um, they adopted the Greek language and Greek culture, and other than some place names, there's really not a lot of surviving legacy from the century or more of Slavic domination in mainland Greece. Many people are aware of some of the basic tensions that existed in the Balkans in the early 20th century which led to the outbreak of World War I. However, not a lot of people are willing to go back and properly attempt to understand the history of Eastern Europe, which is a complex mess. However, if you really do want to understand this history, the first step is understanding the, at least having a general idea of the complexity of the ethnic differences in Eastern Europe from the Middle Ages to the present, and this will be a recurring theme in this course. So we're going to look at the evolution of some of the other peoples in this region, and we will also examine the Ottoman Empire at the end of the course in this light as well. Um, it is my contention, to put it in no uncertain terms, that if you really want to understand anything that occurs in the Balkans from the 8th century forward, you absolutely have to have a basic understanding of the Slavs, the Bulgars, and the Magyars. Um, in addition, you also need to know about the Byzantines and the Ottomans, but that did not neatly fit on that line without messing up the spacing, so I'll just tell you orally rather than writing it. Anyhow, that is it for the Slavic invasion. Um, this hopefully will provide enough of a foundation so that when we talk about the Slavs going forward, you'll have a pretty good idea of who I'm talking about.